Okay, let's welcome Chris Devonport for Telling the Truth with Types. Hey everyone, I'm Chris Davenport. Uh, I work at the Banner Group inside of Jack Henry & Associates. Um, and you can check me out on GitHub at Christopher Davenport or Twitter at DavenPCM. Um, so, wanted to get out. So, uh, who am I? Why am I telling you any of this? Um, so I'm one of the HTTP4S maintainers and a uh, Cat's Effect maintainer. I've been programming in fully functional Scala now for around five years. Uh, and I'm a fairly active open source contributor. Uh, write a couple of libraries. Um, and uh, the reason why I want to you know, go through telling the truth with types is because I think that it's really important for us to have a way to communicate with each other when we read code, when we look at code. And those tools are not being discussed even when we're discussing the functions that we're writing in our day-to-day -day coding lives. And so I went through this journey. I've done all of this stuff, and I am still going through it and learning how to say it better every day. And so hopefully this is useful to all of you as far as learning, as far as communicating, but I'm just as likely to say things and learn new things as I go as well. So when we're talking about our code, what we need to do is be able to start to have conversations. What's going on? in any particular function, and how do we know when we just look at it? We can't come up with some sort of know the body of every function in our entire code base at a glance. That's not what we can operate with. So what we can do is come up with a set of terminology based off of the type system, based off of the way that we can approach and name things. There are many different ways we can talk about our code bases. And we need to be able to figure out when something is not 100% correct. When are we saying something about our code that doesn't hold up? I mean, not everything that we write is going to be 100% sensible, and we're going to write bugs. And we're going to either catch those with tests, or we're going to catch those with our program not compiling. But we need to be able to figure out why that is the way it is. And finally, when we do think, see that something is up, what we need to do is be able to rephrase so that we can say it in a way that's accurate to our intentions. We don't want to say things that we know are wrong and have people react assuming that we're right. Because by default, especially in a strongly typed programming language, we're going to assume that what we're interacting with is correct. And it's going to be on us to, more, to better communicate that. What I'm not going to cover as far as this talk in general is whether or not we should be using descriptive method names. The fact is, <laughs> is that there's a small army of wars that go over whether or not we should name things and how we should name things. And what this is going to be is talking about what we can say without those names, not whether or not we should be using good names in the first place, which, generally speaking, we should probably have a name that somebody understands, whether it's you or somebody else, but someone should understand them. This is not going to be a criticism of people who are utilizing knowledge outside of the type system. Everybody knows things that they haven't had encoded. And it's about us trying to get information into the type system that gives us a power to reason about things. But there's always going to be something at some level which we don't have the full reasoning over. And that's OK. That's, we're not going to criticize that because it's OK that we understand that people are going to reason in different ways, especially if we're going to talk in Scala, where people can communicate in a variety of different ways that aren't just the purely functional subset. We need to be able to communicate with those who are choosing to communicate in a different subset of the language. And finally, this is not going to be really mathematically accurate, because one, I don't know the math that well to be 100% sure that anything I'm saying is correct. So uh, I'm going to tell you that I'm going to do my best to give you terms that are accurate and ability able to express things to other people in my experience when I've been communicating things to others. And so hopefully they will give you the same ability to communicate, and hopefully they're mostly accurate, which I think they are mostly accurate. I'm going to put a big mostly on that one. So as a baseline setup for this presentation, um, I'm using partial unification because I can't operate it without it at this point. I use kind projector so that, that way we can project our types down. Um, 
I think I'm using it very similarly to how Greg was using it earlier, so hopefully it should be mostly understandable. Uh, I have cats and cats effect in here because I'm going to be using those because we need real life examples. And uh, I'm just using shapeless for data types, co-product and h lists. Um, and FS2 I literally just use for a stream, uh, a stream example in one place. So nothing scary here, just cats, cats effects for the primary talk here. So what are some typical examples we might see when we're interacting with normal code? And again, there's no shame in the fact that this code exists and that we use it because we always backdoor. We always take shortcuts and we always get things to ship. So sometimes somebody's gonna write something like this and you're gonna see it and it's gonna be around. We do a division function and we have a numerator and a denominator and uh-oh, that, that's zero. That's not gonna work the way we want it to. So uh, let's just throw an illegal argument exception. That's not right. I'm not happy with it. We're just gonna get rid of it. And I know that like most of this room is going, this is terrible, stop it now. Uh, I mean, I, I can't disagree with the fact that I'm not a giant fan of this, but sometimes you have a requirement. For example, that you have a value that you know, is greater than zero, right? Half the time we're taking integer, we know that we want our integer to be zero, larger than zero, but integer can be negative. Well, if you don't bake that in, you're going to have errors in your code. And so we need to think about how we can bake that in. And so these backdoors happen when we're just writing good functional code as well. And we need to come up with, if we're going to discuss it, ways that we can rephrase these in a more clear way. We can also have meaningless types in our system. So, um, has anybody seen a function like write to the database? They take some, you know, critical data. And they're like, here, here's your data, and then here's your unit. You're good. Okay? <laughs> we wrote this function. Okay? Everything's going to the database just like expected. <laughs> and, you know, so, okay, we, we've got some data and we've got the ability to work with it. Um, then you call the function twice. And what happens on the second time? Yeah, nobody knows. <laughs> I sure as heck don't know what happens. So we wrote the data and uh, okay, so we can see that something's going on. What about when we have you know, this sort of a function that can handle something? And again, this is a pattern that happens in the wild and we're not you know, saying it's a bad function. We do need the ability to do this and I know that you know, some of you have Aqua code bases which are going to be based off of things somewhat like this and that's okay. Like, we have a function and it's going to take any, and then you're gonna have some random object. Hopefully it's in the companion object. That'd be nice. Um, and then you maybe have some other thing else in some other object somewhere else in your code base that you're gonna send to it and it knows how to handle it. So good, that knows how to handle that. And you get a unit back, whatever that means. Okay. And finally, we have use-based functions. Now, uh, I yanked this out of a uh, code base in HTTP4S, um, so uh, only call this function once. Afterwards, this stage is inoperable. Calling this function more than once will result in an error. So uh, anybody else uh, seen a function like this somewhere in their code base where they've shut something down and okay, now this isn't gonna work anymore? I mean, it happens. You definitely have things that we're trying to put linearity into that are not appropriately typed. And so how do you codify that? Well, you just stick a function in there that does it. Hopefully that works out. So instead what we're gonna do is come up with a set of conversational baselines where we can actually reason about even these sort of things and maybe reframe them so we can get a little bit more reasoning power and ability to communicate what we intended when we wrote something like shut down this stage. So we're gonna start with the idea of conversational code. So we're gonna start with some baseline stuff. We're gonna start with there is. We're gonna have given and then, some sort of a for all mechanism so we can talk about types more generally, such that, which is kind of a way to step back and say, well, we're talking generally, but let's you know, be a little bit more specific and give a little bit more context that's necessary on our general types. And then we're gonna talk in terms of and and or, which is logic that we can basically speak in all the time. So hopefully we can, you know, utilizing these terms, start to build up a way to speak about the same functions we've saw and maybe clarify them so that they're a little cleaner. 
So there is, we need to start by proving that something does actually exist in our program. Because it would be useful if we actually were working with real values and not, you know, imaginary ones. So let's say that something does exist, but we can also say that something exists only at one point in our application, not throughout it. So on there is, we can start with a simple code block. There is an integer. We're going to call it A. Does the body of that thing matter? No, not really. Because what we're saying is that there is an integer, and we happen to name it A. So we can have a discussion about that. There is some string, B. Well, it happens to contain the string B, but that also doesn't really have to do with whether or not there is a string or not. We can just say that on the, uh, on the type level or in our conversational approach to code that there is a string. Or we can talk that to something that you know, has a higher kind of constructor, like a list of strings, and that there is a list of strings. So now we've started to bring like, a little bit more compound types. It's a list of strings. And taking from our list of strings that we just had there, if we were to build a flat map into that, then we can say that there is some val i, which is an integer, inside of the scope of that flat map call. That i doesn't exist at the level of the C, and it doesn't necessarily exist anywhere once we leave the scope of that flat map. So while we're in flat map, i has meaning. So there is applies to specific scopes and specific points in the application that we can reason about. And so with that, we can start to say where things exist and whether or not we can talk about them at any point. And this will come up a little bit later when we talk about deferred execution. Finally, we can come up with there exists. Now, I chose there exists as my way of phrasing this. Some people might say more so that, you know, is A, if you have some like actual sort of coherence guarantee as a language as a whole. But I would choose to express it more like there exists because it holds for other things that exist in an implicit context in your application. So for example, there is a case class product and there exists a monoid of the type product and it's implicitly available in the implicit scope. This would then hold for the same phrasing for things like there is an execution context that other thing or there exists an execution context that is used throughout the application or if you had an encoder and decoders inside of some secondary object that you're going to import in a local scope you would there would exist an encoder and decoder that only exists to wherever you have imported those implicits and so utilizing implicits in this way, we can reason and say that there exists something. And this allows us to start with our proving to talk about what exists in an application. To when we have there is and there exists, then we can say, okay, now we can prove things actually are. So now let's walk ourselves back and say, what if things aren't? What can we prove if things actually do exist? So that gets us to given and then and therefore. So the sort of idea here is that given something, we can then prove something else. So it kind of implies we have to admit our own ignorance over what we know at any point in our application. We have to accept that we don't know these things. And so given that such a value does exist, then we can do something else. So in the case of our L function below, we can say given a string, then an int. We can say, given a list of strings, give an int. Now, this function here seems a little specific. So if we were to say that that list was taking the length of that list, we might be able to say something more about that that's not clear right here. Because for as far as we can tell on that list, that list could be the sum of all of the list lengths of each string in that, or any other combination utilizing the information in the string type of each value. So we may want to move that reasoning back even more so if we have something more general. And finally, utilizing class semantics, we can say, given an int, then a string, utilizing cr class semantics as well. So this sort of constructor, which if this exists and we have a, a class custom int class, right, then we can do show, which gives us a string back. 
So this is another way of us moving the given and then is also operating with things like classes as well. So moving from our example that we mentioned with the list of strings, right? We can then talk and say, what about something that's more generic than that list of strings? So if we take some list of A, so you might say, for all A, given a list of A, then an int. And this ability to walk back a little bit gets us to be able to say very more specific things based off of the information we know at any specific scope. If this were to be the length of the list, then we don't need to know the type of string. It's unnecessary, and so we can clarify the semantics that we're using by removing the extraneous data. We can also gain things like the identity function, which is that f function there, which says given an a, then return an a. And if you want to uh, prove it, well, then let's just prove it. You know, we take a function, we give it its length, then we take the function and we return the initial a. I don't know anything else about what's going on there or what's going on in any of those. You can use this in any context because I don't know what A is and it doesn't matter to the semantic we're trying to express. And this is all well and good. We have lists, we have whatnot, but we need to get a little bit more specific because sometimes you want to do something that uses that information that you don't have available. So what if you need A to be a little bit specific? Something, but not anything. So we're going to use the term such that. So we're going to say something exists so that there is such that something exists. So it's for all such that. It's generally paired with for all. And so we can think of this like type classes and our implicit evidences are things that we're asking to exist that somebody else has to prove exists, such as the there exists we mentioned earlier, in order to be able to use this. And it has to be available in the scope we're in. And we can say that that's true inside of a given location. So combine with a semi-group, then given an a and an a, then an a. For fold, we say given a higher kind of type g, such that g is foldable, and a such that a is a monoid, given g a, then a. And I put fold two there to show you guys that the uh, kind projector uh, or excuse me, the uh, type annotation there is the uh, same as the implicit evidences. And we can prove that just by putting those in place, combining them together, and running fold map, and calling the method above to prove that they really are the same thing. And finally, we're going to talk about and. So this allows compound statements. And this is very necessary for us to talk about what we gain at any re level, depending on what information we have. So. Given traits and classes, we can say given A, then B and C. So we can try to take one piece of information and, and expand it to multiple proofs. And we can also take, for example, case classes, products, H lists, and functions, given A and B, then C. So in the case of the trait function ball, we, we have the proof of a function ball, and that then proves back, seat, and legs. In the case of the chair function, we get back, seat, and legs, then chair. And on both sides of the equation is case classes, where you have the ability to say, given a chair, we can get back out its back, seat, and legs. And you get the apply method for free, which is the ability to take all three of those things and go and prove a chair. So it's just going back and forth between the compound and the, independent, and the single proof. And then lastly, in our lexicon here, we're going to be talking about or, which is you know either or a coproduct. So given A or B, then C. And this is useful because then we can talk about things in terms of actually collapsing a graph on multiple sides. We can take multiple pieces of information and condense them. So if we take a collapse of int and string, then we might you know take the length of the string and get back out the int for our other side. And we can do something like for all higher kinded G, higher kinded H, and a type A, then the either K is defined as either G of A, H of A. And 
So then we can build a differing piece depending on which type we have, which piece of evidence we have. And lastly, I'm going to be uh, covering this briefly because it's going to be covered a little bit later in the next talk. Um, deferred composition. So any given scope, we're going to lack the information to reason about how something happens that's based on the type f. So we can say that the int algebra here is for all f, then, and we can say given an int, then an f of unit, and given an int to an int, an f of unit, and an f of int. So the ability for us to combine, combine these things, but this is operating at the scope of for all f. We don't know what that f is. But then in the impl, we actually give it more meaning by giving an f such that f is a sink. And this allows us to create the scope of the meaning of that int algebra. And in this case, it's just setting, updating, and getting the values. So we're going to now take that and try to build on our concepts a little bit more. So what if we start with something that, like, we want to prove something from initial constructs. We can say we have nothing, and let's just build something. So we're going to say that we're going to have a simple IO app from Cat's Effect. This is going to say hello to everybody in the room. So when we have our IO app, we say methods write hello, and utilizing our language so far, for all f, such that f is a sync, then f of unit, and the ability of f in sync to suspend arbitrary side effects is what's writing the print line. And then we then concretize that to IO in our IO app, and since there exists implicit evidence that IO satisfies that constraint sync, then this comp computation runs and we get a full, a full application. So we're using the initial proof in the companion object of IO that IO satisfies a sync constraint to prove that we can write this program and that it, when it compiles, we know it's going to do what we want it to do. So we're going to go a little bit more complicated now. We're going to talk about HTTP. Um, and so I'm going to really simplify things because it's way easier to talk about HTTP in terms of a simplified structure. So we're going to have a socket, very simplified socket of what FS2IO exposes, um, where we have a read, where for all f, we can get an f of a vector of bytes. We're just going to say it's all of them, because that's easier to reason about. And that we're going to write, and we're going to take all of the bytes we have to write, and we're just going to write them back into the socket. We have a request, which is a method, a version, the actual query, the headers, and a body. And we have the response, which is the status code, the HTTP version, the headers, and the body. Everybody should be familiar with this. And so what if, since we have these structures and we have now these compound information, let's start to ask what we need to write a server. So if we say that the sockets are a resource that we get in an infinite stream, which again is coming from FS2's in, ter in terms there, but given that we have an infinite stream of the sockets that connect, then if we have some parser, from socket of f to an f of request, and some HTTP app, which is a request to an f of response, and some renderer, which takes the socket, the response, to an f of unit, and then some max parallelism, which is going to be the level of concurrency we operate at, which that constraint should be concurrent for those who are type checking me, because I just saw that. Um, and what we're going to do is take each resource, turn it into a stream. And then we're going to evaluate that by taking the parser and reading the request from that body, um, running the app, and then rendering that back to the socket. And then we're going to run however many we just had in parallel. So this gives us the way to talk about what we've done. We can build a stream of nothing, which doesn't seem that impressive, really. So let's revisit our normal that we just talked about at the beginning. We just had these things that we interact with that aren't that great, and we want to come up with ways that we can talk about them a little bit more clearly. So we started with that divide function, right, where we had a legal argument exception. Well, what if we tried to generalize this a little bit? And this is a little bit more complex use of kind projector. So for all f, 
such that f has an applicative error of f throwable, and an int, and an int, then an f of a double, where the double is, or the f has the context of whatever that applicative error is capable of handling. And so then with that, we just summon our applicative error, raise it, or we lift it with pure and get our value back. We can also, you know, then call that with either. And uh, once we've called that with either on div opt, we can call it to option and get the optional version, which everybody is familiar with as far as the way to handle this problem. You can also make it safer. So let's just, you know, build our, our class where the concept of non-zero int we know is not zero. We lock that with the sealed abstract case class, put it in the companion object, and then we can get safe division where we know that our denominator isn't zero. And what about useless types? So uh, given our write to database function, we can just say, well, let's wrap it in something that can do that. I mean, if it fails, it fails. If it doesn't, but at least we're talking about it in terms of what it's capable of doing at any one scope. And finally, let's say that we have something with like sealed traits where we need to manage something. You may remember this is the posher function value where we expect everything should be operating, you know, in a linear form in that framework. So what we need is a sync IO. And so given that we match on this something type, then we can get sync IO out. Also, if you're trying to, you know, stay with the model where everything is completely abstract. You can just build shapeless co-products of all the individual types as well, and then you don't have to force them into a sealed trait. And finally, Cats of Vector already had the resource stage for us done, where what we're gonna do is we're going to bracket our system and build it up into a resource, which will automatically shut down the stage. And so then what we're gonna need to do is use that at some point and that will get us back to the context where whatever you're using at that point will be doing everything we need to do. And stage no longer needs to know how to shut itself down because the resource is in charge of shutting itself down. So as a recap, we want to be able to approach our code in this conversational framework where we can look at each function and say, for all F, this is true. For all A, this is true. And not have to be uh, arguing about whether or not functions are even talking about the same thing. We need to build up our framework by which we can communicate with each other in a clear way. And then we can then trust each other and give each other respect for our ability to read those, what we've written. Because when we're all speaking in these terms about what's being written, even in the terms of a function to unit, we can say that that function is doing something or hopefully nothing at all. So. That's my talk, everybody. We're opening up for questions. <clears throat> or while we're waiting for, oh, we have a question. Okay. Could you briefly revisit the intuition behind uh, there exists? Yeah, so um, there exists is a little complicated. Um, so because of the way that implicit scopes work in Scala, the intuition I want to get across is that this value exists in the scope in which that value is imported implicitly. So you can say that this exists canonically within the scope that that value is because any, if you had two values of the same type within the same scope, those would no longer resolve. You'd have compilation errors. And so there exists within a scope and it's, it is limited to the point at which that scope is canonical for that lo location, that's true. And in other languages, they do things like new typing and you know, forcing it so that it is A for that specific type. But with implicit scope, it's more like existence for that specific. Another question? Or while we're waiting for a question, we still have a little time. Anybody's welcome to tell a joke. <laughs> there we go. A joke or a question? No jokes. <laughs> Can you please go back to the slide where you were talking about revisiting shutdown? Which, the, the initial one or the? Uh, the, the revisit, 
Resume. The resource? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So c can you like maybe expand the answer to that? Because like it wasn't super clear. So Cat's Effect resource is um, designed in such a way that it's an acquisition of a resource, and then after a uh, when we uh, we can compose resources together, but then in reverse order, then we are sh calling the finalizers to shut that information down. So. What that means is that in the case of this, we can use our stage at whenever point where that stage is valid, and then it will then be uh, shut down once the use function completes. You can think of this kind of like a continuation, and in that continuation, you can see that that stage is active and valid, but then after that point, it will whatever the, has kept that resource, quote, alive, or finalizers need to be run because of that resource, those will be done. And in the case of this stage, which is active for a specific period of time, then we uh, need to walk that back and shut down the stage at that point because it's only alive while we're using it. Okay, and uh, yeah, thank you. Um, that, it was it wasn't like super clear because in the original one you had like shut down with some comment. Here you like uh, uh, yeah. If you if you miss what you said or like something, then it's like hard to you know like link those two. But uh, you can also model that as with something like like fandom types, right? For example, like you have like something in open state, whatever, and then you can uh, call shut down only when it's there. When you call it once, then just change the state and it's close, and you can call shut down again, right? Like, can you maybe compare these approaches and like? I mean, the difficulty with what with that is that you're referring to at a minimum then. Um, so assuming that you have some phantom type that represents whether or not something's operational or not, you're going to need concurrent access mechanisms to that value. And so in the terms of like an index state or something like that, that's not going to apply due to the fact that multiple things may be using it in a concurrent time frame, and that could change the state arbitrarily of your phantom type parameter. And so it's general, I mean, that's resource is useful for this cleaning up the finalizer scope, but you can use that uh, in sort of a, a linear fashion to make sure that you're following through with your expected order of uh, types. Yeah, thank you. Now that you've cleaned up the blaze stage in the slide deck, when can we expect the pull request that cleans it up for real? <laughs> um, when I can figure out how to uh, make blaze uh, understandable to my own sensibilities once again. So not soon. <laughs> so what I liked was that you, you're giving names for these uh, constructs that we're, we're using. I was curious if you had any experiments or experience sort of teaching it or using it within your own company or, or elsewhere to sort of as this, you know, ubiquitous language to, to translate between these ideas and the code? Absolutely. Um, so I try to use these concepts in general as a way of uh, clarifying and making these things more understandable. For example, saying that you have that, uh, the list of strings, right? And then you can say, well, does the type of the, in, of the, str of the list matter to whatever you're defining? And if not, can we then build something that's you know more abstract? And so we can. I'm f I find that utilizing this sort of terms and language about what you're using, and you can do that at each because you when you write things like there exists a val at some level, what information do you need to prove that? And so you can walk that back into a more abstract function as well. And so I found a lot of success communicating this and having teams use this as a tool to communicate more clearly about the code that we are interacting with and making it cleaner over time. Another one? Anybody else? Uh, more, more, more a joke now. Would you go like um, further? Like you, ha you had like um, uh, the parallelism, one of the parameters that I was int. Would you go to make it like uh, positive into something? Just to say the truth. That's certainly reasonable. <laughs> that is certainly reasonable. Um, I'll have to go talk to Michael and Fabio about that this instant. So, I, they, they may be listening right now, so who knows? Okay. And, and second kind of question, like, why do you think that HTTP version is uh, 
like represents the minimal HTTP request and response? Um, well, that was what I came up with as, the, I mean, as far as what I think of as the minimal one, uh, the fact is, is that you have your, the, the prelude section and then the headers and then the body, and you can break the prelude up similarly to what I did with it just being like the white space delimited section. So that's, then I just made them strings and rather than having any types. So that was why I made it the simplest, but I'm sure that there is a way to call that slightly simpler. Anybody else in the back? Stories? Appreciations? I actually have a very, very stupid question. What's the difference between throwing and raising? So the difference between throwing and raising in this context is the fact that the throwing is completely hidden from the person who is calling that function. So you, yeah. if you were to think of it, the th term throw is a lot like saying that we exist in an entire language where everything has the idea that everything could be throwing at any point, which is kind of hard to reason about. So if we can instead walk that into a place where we can reason that we are lifting everything into something and where we ended up using that on uh, this page, um, in the uh, div opt section, what we actually do is we call div using either throwable and that type. And with that, since it has an applicative error of throwable, we're just creating a left. And so we're saying that f has some context which knows about that throwable, which says that our types then are respecting the fact that we are doing something with throwable there. We're not changing the semantics of actually operating with some throwable, but that our types respect that we are doing something that is capable of interacting with one. Thank you. Thank you for asking that question. I just want to point out that there's no stupid question because we all have different backgrounds. So thank you for being so brave and ask the question. So along the no stupid questions line, uh, <laughs> aren't you basically just describing Howard Curry except in English rather than with proofs? Yes, except for the fact that as I said, I didn't want to uh, claim to be a mathematician when I am not and claim that my logic is sound. Um, hopefully, and hopefully you guys can be the judge, I ended up somewhere close to sound. But uh, I, I think that it's a useful term and we can hopefully approach actual logic. So given that answer, uh, do you find that people who are not mathematically oriented are able to be receptive to this way of describing strongly typed uh, programs uh, and, and uh, accept that line of reasoning? Or do you still find a response of, why should I care? I'm not trying to prove things. Well, if you try to say that they're proving things, you may end up having some uh, difficulties. Um, but if you do instead try to communicate in terms of, so what I, when I read this function, I hear that given a list, I'm going to receive a uh, int or using this given this then I will get versus then I prove which is also true but is necessarily more easy to uh, be accepted by people who are less mathematically inclined and so you can still get the same sort of results because then you're building a language that you can both discuss because inputs and outputs make sense in any terms in programming language whether or not you're doing throwing or whether or not we're doing functional programming or not, inputs and outputs is the nature of programming. Uh, again, because I'm sort of a beginner, rather than kind of do what we've done with divide, is it better to just kind of make sure that it takes something like, uh, not numeric, but something equivalent like fractional? I mean, fractional is definitely a type that you can represent as well. So you have the rational type. Um, you can definitely uh, represent division in a multitude of different ways. The main re reason I thought of this is, you know, uh, the example I had was that you, you know, had something that was every uh, an amount that they were doing per years and then how many years old they were. And then, you know, you then somebody put in and they, you know, had a 10 week old baby. It then, you know, rounded down to zero and then your entire system broke. 
That was my mental model when I originally wrote the why you might end up with something that you knew, you knew would never happen to be a zero. And then, you know, you round it down and it all broke. Got it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm seeing type lambdas here, and I'm seeing higher kinded type lambdas here. Uh, what's the story on that? Are we talking about my use of kind projector here? Um, so uh, on the div function, it's just casting the higher kinded f into the applicative error. So you can see the f on the left is the type that's then projected into the applicative error. And in the bottom one, we are just saying that we want the either such that the projected type that we're putting into the either is on the right-hand side of that either, which is the side that the monad error of either is defined for. So it's just a way of utilizing kind projector to make it easier to uh, write these types rather than the projection, which uses is unpleasant to write. That's, that's the answer there. It's just unpleasant to write. And you don't need any voodoo like aux pattern to get this to work? No. No, this is entirely based on uh, the uh, kind projector plugin that I'm using to uh, project wherever those you see the question marks in the last function and on the upper function is how we, uh, that's all that's happening as far as the projection is concerned. So no lambda, or no aux pattern. What happens if you want to be able to abstract over uh, potentially even higher kinded types of things that you pass into uh, applicative error. Say that you want to pass something that itself has type parameters into that and be able to abstract over that as well. Does that does this whole thing work recursively? Um, so, kind, uh, so right now, kind projector works three layers deep to the th the third kind at the moment. Uh, I ended up causing a new release when I accidentally asked for that. Um, and uh, if you wanted to instead also uh, project something into the E, which uh, is uh, not to, so you only are gonna project from this layer um, into one type because you're applying it to a specific type. But let's say you wanted to do over applicative error uh, F of E, and you had an E that you wanted to put in there. If you put the E as a param type parameter to the left of the F, then you could then reference that on the one to the right. So it would be like E F applicative error with the question mark, and then E. And so you could do it that way as well by putting the E type parameter on the left. Cool, thank you. All right, let's thank Chris.